Hello, Susanna Lopez here, actor turned barrister turned broadcaster turned true crime writer and proud member of Sisters in Crime Australia. Welcome to the Scarlet Stiletto Bites podcast. For over 30 years now, Sisters in Crime Australia has supported our women crime writers, both true crime and fiction, and some criminal literary talent has been unearthed. Among many awards, there's an annual prize for short crime fiction, the Scarlet Stiletto Awards. And for those of you who prefer your stories by ear, in 2023, we commenced this podcast series, Scarlet Stiletto Bites, to celebrate the sisters' 30th anniversary. Each story is short, but not always sweet. Expect Twisted Tales, quirky humour and a frisson of feminism. Please support us by following, sharing, reviewing and generally spreading the word. We have no paywall. In days gone by, women were assumed to be less competent than men and the law didn't always help. So sometimes women were obliged to take the law into their own hands as in today's story. Death in the Skies by Jessica Southern Reed 2020 winner Scarlet Stiletto and Mystery with History The day was perfect, the sky was clear, the air was still and the plane was magnificent. Evelyn held the control column with one finger, marvelling at the way the machine responded to the lightest touch. She was used to ferrying damaged planes to the air transport auxiliary. Not this time. This plane was brand new and she had fought hard for the right to be the first in the cockpit. There had been some ruffled feathers amongst the RAF boys, but she hadn't cared and now she was zooming above the world in the best plane she'd flown since the start of the war. She soared over the patchwork fields of southern England, keeping an eye out for barrage balloons. To her left was the distant glimmer of the channel. A shadow ran through the engine and she frowned. The aircraft lost altitude before righting itself. Evelyn didn't panic. She checked all of her controls and found the dials were all where they were supposed to be. Once more, a shudder ran through the engine, stalling it. Bugger, she muttered, still determinedly not panicking. She had read her pilot's manual so many times that she could practically recite the passage on mid-flight engine restarting blindfolded. She confidently pushed the nose of the plane down towards Earth and sent it into a dive. If in doubt, point the whirly bit towards the ground and hope you have enough space to get going again, Evelyn told herself, remembering what her instructor had said years before. The engine remained stubbornly silent, refusing to be restarted. And if all else fails, look for a road or a smooth-looking field, extend and lock wheels and say a little prayer, she added, working the landing gear lever as she spoke. According to her instruments, the plane was still perfect, aside from the fact that the engine wouldn't start. The ground rushed up to meet her, but Evelyn held the plane steady. She flew low over fields and roads and readied herself for landing. At the last moment, she took her eyes off the ground and reached for the photograph she carried in her breast pocket. Two small boys witnessed the crash and hurried over on their bicycles. They leapt the hedgerow and sprinted to the downed plane. It had come to rest in the far corner of the field, leaving a trail of destruction behind it. The pilot had misjudged her landing. Had it been the middle of summer, she likely would have pulled it off, but the autumn had been long and wet and the field was sodden. 
She had hit the ground too hard, her landing gear getting caught in the November mud. The boys pulled the cracked cockpit cover back to reveal the pilot. Hey, it's a girl, exclaimed one. And she's dead, added the other excitedly. Poor wee lass, the farmer muttered, shaking his head. A man in an official-looking uniform stood beside him, agreeing somewhat absent-mindedly. He arranged for the aircraft to be towed to the nearby aerodrome, where he could examine it properly in a hangar, and where his feet were less likely to get wet. Evelyn's funeral was a week later. Her fellow ATA pilots wore their uniforms, pressed blue jackets and pleated skirts. The local vicar spoke of her virtues, though he never met her. At the back, Mabel sobbed. Tears flowed fast and freely down her cheeks and dripped off her chin. Ruth stood on one side of her, Florence the other, ready to catch her should she sway. I want to see the plane, Florence announced when they got back to the room they all shared. Why? asked Ruth sardonically. Well, don't you think it's a bit strange? Florence asked. We've been over this already, Ruth replied. Yes, we do think it's strange, but what can we do about it? She's dead. Seeing the plane won't bring her back. None of the girls could believe that Evelyn, who was by far the best pilot amongst them, had managed to crash a brand new plane. They flew damaged aircraft all the time, but this one had been perfect. Until it had ploughed into a turnip field and taken their squadron leader with it, that was. I know it won't bring her back, but I just don't understand why it happened and I want to see the plane. Florence repeated. Ruth looked as though she was about to mount an argument, but Mabel interrupted. I'd like to see it too, she said quietly. It was settled. There was to be no arguing with Mabel, not on the day of Evelyn's funeral, so they went. The down plane had been dragged to the hangar to await expert examination. The aerodrome was abuzz with activity as final preparations were done for the nightly bombing raids. Nobody paid the slightest bit of attention to the three ATA pilots. Is it here? Mabel asked as they reached the hangar. I'm scared to look. Ruth switched on her flashlight. The plane looked terrifying in the darkness, like some kind of broken monster. The hangar was full of spare parts and aerodrome debris, and shadows danced on the walls and the flashlight glinted off Evelyn's cracked cockpit cover. Mabel, you don't have to do this, Ruth said carefully. I think I do. Right, well, best get on with it, Florence said, her mechanic's brain ticking almost audibly. She ran her hands along the wing struts and the ripped fuselage, examining it all. She climbed up onto the wing and pulled back the cockpit cover. It all looks perfect, she exclaimed, puzzled. She reached in and pulled out a scrap of paper before jumping down and landing cat-like beside them. She popped open the fuel cap and stuck the flashlight in, Barely a moment had passed before she pulled it out with a gasp. She plunged her arm in up to the elbow. Withdrawing it, she held something tightly between her thumb and forefinger. What, what is it? Mabel asked warily. Florence held the flashlight close, examining her fingers. She stuck her tongue out and licked her finger. It's sugar! She gasped. Someone's laced the avgas with sugar. You can't be serious, Ruth said, and grabbed the flashlight from Florence to check for herself. You're right. Bloody hell, how did that get in there? 
Well, it certainly wasn't by accident, said Florence. Someone must have sabotaged her. Who would do something like that? And why? Ruth asked. A sudden noise from outside caused the girls to freeze. Ruth switched off the flashlight and they were plunged into darkness. All three dropped to the ground and they crawled behind the wing of a hurricane. Another flashlight beam lit the room and they huddled down out of sight. Let's get this done quickly, a voice instructed. The girls heard a strange combination of noises. Somebody was climbing on the wrecked plane and there was an odd sucking noise like a plug being pulled from a drain. Finally a sound they all knew. The sound of a fuel tank being filled from a jerry can. A funeral was today, a second voice said. Who cares? One less demented bint in the sky, if you ask me, said the first voice, full of malice. Ruth reached out in the darkness and found Mabel's hand, squeezing it tight. I didn't know she'd die, the second voice said. It's a war, Humphreys. People die. Do you feel bad for every German bastard you blow out of the sky? Besides, it's not our fault. She could land properly. The girls stayed rooted to the spot long after the two men had left the hangar. When the silence was finally broken, Ruth's voice was icy. They killed her. They killed her because they didn't want her in the sky. I, I found this, Florence said, offering Mabel the piece of paper from the cockpit. Illuminated in the beam of the flashlight, they could see what it was. A photograph. It was slightly damp and the glossy surface was marred with flecks of blood, much like the interior of the cockpit. In the photograph, two girls sat close together. Evelyn, her thousand-watt smile in full force, beamed at the camera. Her arm was around Mabel's shoulder, drawing her closer as Mabel planted a kiss on Evelyn's cheek. Mabel glanced quickly at it and stuffed it into her breast pocket. She didn't need to look. She had her own copy of the photograph, tucked safely between the pages of her aeronautics manual. Oh, Mabel, Florence said, I'm so sorry. The three girls snuck out of the hangar and crossed the darkened runway to the Nissan huts they called home. You don't think they did it because, you know... She was a Tom, Ruth asked, throwing an apologetic glance to Mabel. I doubt they even knew. Anyway, the way that brute was talking, it sounded as though he sabotaged her because she's a woman, not because she loved women, Florence reasoned. And now they're destroying the evidence, cleaning out the fuel tank. The investigation's going to say it was pilot error. We can't let that happen. We have to report them, Mabel said, looking utterly distraught. Well, there's something else I need to tell you both that I swore I'd never say, so this has to stay between us, Florence whispered conspiratorially. Remember Emily Granger? Well, she came to me after her crash and asked me to have a look at the Lancaster she'd been flying. She thought... There might have been something wrong with it. She left the ATA after the crash, didn't she? Ruth asked. Yes, but not before she came to see me. We took that engine apart. Nobody cared much. It was an old plane. They hadn't even taken it out of the field she'd crashed into. Flo, get to the point, Ruth urged. Rags, Florence answered. The engine was full of rags, wrapped around everything. It was obvious she'd been sabotaged. Well, what did you do? Well, we reported it, of course. We went to the air commodore, but he didn't want to hear what we had to say. I was told to keep mum about the whole thing or risk my wings, and Emily was booted out, dishonourably discharged. How horrible, Mabel said. 
I think we need to speak to her. Ruth pushed open the heavy door of the pub, squinting as she led the way from the bright sunlight to the gloomy, low-lit interior of the Rose and Crown. Oh, it's so good to see you all again, Emily said, rising as they approached and hugging them each in turn. I'm so sorry about Ev, she said to Mabel, whose eyes filled with tears. They'd been doing that on a regular basis ever since the crash. She blinked furiously and hurried off to the bar. The thing is, Emily, this is not just a social catch-up. Flo told us about your plane and what they did to you, and we think they did the same to Evelyn. Only she didn't make it out alive. Emily gave Florence a horrified look. What if they find out you've told someone? They've practically threatened to court-martial us if we said so much as one word. I'm, I'm sorry, Florence said, but I had to. See, the thing is, Ev was just like you, maybe even a better flyer, and she was in a brand new plane. There's no way she caused the crash, but that's what they're saying. So we snuck a look at her plane, and we found sugar in her fuel tank, but we don't have any proof, because they've already drained it to get rid of the evidence. We just thought, Ruth said, that you might have some idea of who it was that sabotaged your plane. Emily drummed her fingertips on the table slowly. You know, some of the men think we're taking their job, so I, I just assumed it was one of them, but like you, I've got no proof. A sudden burst of swearing came from near the bar, and the girls turned. A large blonde man in uniform was swaying drunkenly. Next to him, dwarfed by his height, stood Mabel, clutching four half-pints. "'Wash where you're going, little girl,' slurred the man. "'Bloody women, you ferry a few planes, and you think you're as good as us. Get out of the way!' Mabel looked like she was about to burst into tears again, but regaining her composure, pulled herself up to her full height of five foot three and stomped hard on his foot before escaping under his raised arm. The man staggered in the other direction, mumbling obscenities, the most discernible of which was, Fucking demented bint! That man, Florence said quickly, what did he just call you? Oh, it, it, it's nothing, forget it, Mabel said, keen to move on. No, he called you a demented bint. Isn't that what the man in the hangar said? Oh, could be, he was certainly rude enough. It's the same voice, I'm sure of it, Florence insisted. The others didn't seem as convinced. That's William Farrier. His father's the Marshal of the RAF. He's a brute and a bully. I flew in a hurricane with him once and he kept making passes at me in the cockpit. I made a complaint to the Commodore, but he told me I was best to forget it. Farrier's untouchable, Emily told them, lips pursed. But do you really think he could sabotage a plane? Ruth asked. Well, he hates female pilots and he knows his way around an engine. But even if it is him, how do we prove it? Emily asked. Ruth had a gleam in her eye that bespoke bad things for Farrier. I've got an idea, but you're not going to like it, she said, grinning at Florence. Unbutton your blouse a bit and go make friends with him. It might help if you mention how much you hate women pilots. Why have I got to do it? Florence asked. Easy. He's seen Emily and Mabel, and my drink is full, Ruth reasoned. Hi there, flyboy, Florence battered her lashes. I was told this was where I might find myself a, a real pilot. You've got that right, girlie. Farrier raked Florence up and down with his eyes, unabashedly pausing on her chest. She felt a wave of revulsion through her, but fought it off with a smile. Oh, you boys are so brave, 
Florence gushed. I can't believe I'm actually here talking to a captain. Florence knew full well from his uniform that Farrier was only a second officer, but he failed to correct her. You must fly so many dangerous missions. Farrier visibly swelled with pride. Yes, I do. Really dangerous ones. He reached out to grope Florence's bottom, but she deftly sidestepped. And I can't believe the government's employing girls to fly those planes when they have men like you. I mean, surely they, they can't be as good. Disgraceful. Should be making cakes and making babies. He trailed off. And I don't understand why any girl would want to fly a plane when she could be at home cooking and cleaning for her very own hero, Florence said, wondering if she was laying it on a bit thick. Not, not right in the head. None of them. But don't worry, I, I fixed them. Oh, really? Florence tried, keeping her tone admiring. How about... I'll tell you all about it, he said, hiccuping. Over dinner. Let's say seven tomorrow here. Oh, that dress is perfect, Emily said. They were cosily ensconced in their room for a war council, helping Florence to get ready for her date. He's going to tell you everything and more. Well, what am I supposed to do if he gets all handsy, Florence asked, conscious of the low cut of the dress and the low morals of her date. Well, I have something for that, Emily said, pulling a little vial of pills from her purse. Well, what are those? Florence asked, examining the pills. I nicked them from Dad. He uses them to get to sleep. Thought it might come in handy if you needed him to be a bit dazed, you know, to make him confess. Em, you're an evil genius. Now remember, Ruth cut in, you need to make him talk. Get him to tell you how he did it without anybody noticing that kind of thing. Oh, Ruth, I'm so unbelievably well briefed on this mission. I think I could do it in my sleep, Florence said reassuringly. Right, well, off you go then. It's, it's nearly seven, Mabel said. Florence put on her coat and took a slug from her little silver hip flask before tucking it into her handbag. Liquid courage, she explained. She kissed them all goodbye and went out into the cold, not feeling nearly as brave as she had pretended to be. Farrier was waiting for her outside the bar, looking significantly cleaner and more sober than the previous night. He led her inside and they found a table. He was attentive and sweet and nothing like the drunken buffoon the girls had encountered the night before. Florence could almost feel his charm working on her, but reminded herself that he was likely the one who sabotaged Evelyn Spitfire. Tell me about your missions, Captain, Florence flattered. It must be awfully dangerous. Of course, but when you're up there in the sky, all you need to do is think of the beautiful girls waiting for you when you land. Farrier replied with a winning smile, If I knew I had a girl like you waiting for me back on the ground, I'd never have to worry about a thing. She giggled, inwardly cringing. Florence had been concerned with her ability to tell a lie if he asked her anything personal, but she needn't have worried. William Farrier didn't ask her a single question about herself. Oh, what kind of uh, planes do you fly? Me, Spitfires. Yep, I'm a fighter pilot and a damned good one if I do say so, he said cockily. I read in the papers that there was a Spitfire crashed not far from here only last week. Did you know the pilot? Florence asked, fighting to keep her tone light. Ah, oh, that. 
A bloody waste of a play, that was. But like I always say, that's what you get when you put girls in the cockpit. It's the air, you see, he explained. It's thinner up there, and and women, it it affects their brains differently. They, They lose their senses. You don't think there should be any women in the planes? Absolutely not. It's it's nothing personal. Like I said, the thin air affects their brains. It's simply biology. Oh, oh well, I suppose there's not much you can do about it. At least they don't let women go on missions and fire guns, Florence said, steering the conversation. Oh, you might be surprised. There are some of us who see it as our duty to get those girls out of our planes. Ah, but I shouldn't say. Oh, go on. Tell me, Florence teased, taking his hand and smiling coquettishly. Well, let's just say that lass, the one who crashed the spitfire, she might have had some help. Florence leaned forward in her seat, willing him to continue. A yell came from the other side of the room, and Farrier's attention was stolen. Ah, Humphreys, you old dog, he yelled jovially to a man who had just entered the pub. The name clicked with Florence, and she wondered if she was about to meet the other man from the hangar. Humphreys, may I introduce you to the lovely Florence? Farrier gestured to her, as though she was a prize he'd won. Humphreys took her hand, and Florence fought the urge to rip her fingers from his clammy grip. "'Where were we?' he asked, shooing Humphreys away. "'The the Spitfire, you didn't, you know, do something to it, did you?' she asked, forcing herself to giggle, as though it was the naughtiest thing she had ever said. "'I might have done.' he whispered conspiratorially, but that's nothing. You should hear about what we've got planned next. Florence's blood ran cold. She swallowed and made herself smile up at him, as though there wasn't a thought between her pretty ears. Actually, you know what, he said, I can show you if you like. Shall we get out of here? She stood and slipped back into her coat, hoping he got the message. She didn't trust herself to speak, worried that her voice might come out shaking. Humphreys, he called, we're off. Florence wants me to show her hangar two. Perhaps she'll let you join us later on. He winked at his friend and turned back to Florence. Oh, don't worry about him. He can never get the girls for himself, so sometimes he likes to watch. Florence gave him a vapid smile and fought the urge to vomit into her handbag. She allowed herself to be led back down the road and to Hangar 2. It was the biggest hangar at RAF Maidenhead, but was mostly empty due to the nighttime raids happening all over occupied Europe. Two days from now, he told her, four planes are being ferried to RAF Hamburg. I've had a few of the lads make complaints about the girls who'll be flying them. They're incompetent, they come to work drunk, that sort of thing. Now, when the whole squadron fails to arrive at Hamble, they'll have to look into the complaints, won't they? He explained, tapping his nose genially. Why won't they arrive at Hamble? It's simple, really bit of sugar in the fuel tank. It clogs the filter and stalls the engine in mid-air. Well, how can you be sure it'll work? She asked, barely keeping her voice steady. It already has. That lass in the spitfire? That was us. Bit of a bungle, that one. Brand spanking new plane, so there's an investigation. We had to do a bit of a switch of the fuel before they could check it. Florence's mouth fell open at the readiness of his confession. Farrier interpreted this as a sign of how impressed she was. Oh, don't worry, they'll never catch us. We're cleverer by far than those idiot girls, he reassured, wrapping his arm around her waist and pulling her close. Um, it's, it's getting late, 
she said, attempting to disentangle herself. Oh, where do you think you're going, Missy? I bought you dinner, remember? She realised he had no intention of letting her leave. Do, uh, do, do you fancy a drink? She stuttered, pulling the hip flask from her handbag. He grinned at her and moved to grab it. Wait, can we have a, a bit more light? I, I w- w- want to be able to see you. Oh, of course you do, he laughed. I'll be right back, don't you move. He crossed the hangar to the little office in the corner in search of some candles. The second his back was turned, Florence scrabbled through her handbag for the tiny vial of pills. She popped a handful into the flask and secured the lid, shaking it surreptitiously. Faria returned with a kerosene lamp and a pilot's greatcoat, which he spread on the floor next to an open-bellied Lysander. He sat on the coat and motioned for her to join him. She did, putting the flask to her lips, keeping them tightly shut. She passed it back to him and he gulped back several mouthfuls. Where were we? he said in what he obviously thought was a seductive tone. He reached up and took her cheek in his hand, leaning in, eyes closed, lips puckered. Florence recoiled, and he fell forward. She jumped up, ready to fight him off, but he slumped down, his face hit the floor. Florence breathed a sigh of relief, but that was cut short, when a voice rang out through the hangar. Oi, Fario, is that you? called Humphreys. Florence slipped into the shadows behind the Lysander and armed herself with a wrench. The girls played cards by the light of a single candle, none of them paying much attention to the game or waiting for Florence's return. She opened the door and practically fell through it. She was shaking from head to toe and there was a look of utter terror in her eyes. What happened? Mabel asked, wrapping the trembling Florence in a tight hug. I did something bad, she stuttered. Help, please. She broke free of Mabel's hug and fled the room. The three girls, astounded, followed her. They ran the whole way back to Hangar 2. There, in the middle of the hangar, next to the Lysander, were two prone figures, illuminated by a kerosene lantern. Flo, what did you do? asked Ruth, aghast. But that gave him some of the pills. He was trying it on and I didn't know how to get away, Florence explained. And and him, she added, pointed to Humphreys, he saw Farrier on the ground and I, I didn't know what to do so I, I hit him with a r- r- wrench, she sobbed. How many pills did you give him? Emily asked, picking up Farrier's arm and dropping it on his own face. Um, I don't know, maybe five? Five? Well, Dad takes two and he's out for the night. I wonder what this will do to him. I don't like the way blood's coming out of his ear, Ruth said, turning Humphrey's head to the side. Did you make sure it was them before you tried to commit murder? Mabel asked. It, it was them, and I, I learnt that they're planning another sabotage for two days' time. There are four planes being ferried to Hamble, and he says they're going to bring them all down. He told me all about it. Gosh, he was so stupid. All I had to do was bat my eyelashes and pretend to hate female pilots, and he told me everything. Pride of the RAF, those two, she said disdainfully. Four! Emily squawked. They're going to sabotage four planes. Unless we stop them, Mabel said. I'm not sure this fellow will be up to much sabotage, Ruth said, gesturing to Humphreys. Ladies, we have a more pressing matter on our hands, Emily interrupted. What are we supposed to do with these two? I I might actually have an idea. Florence said slowly. I was thinking about it while I was hiding from the one I hit with the wrench. Well, go on, Emily urged. We're going to need a plane. 
Mabel waved to the ground crew as she climbed into the cockpit of the Avro Anson. Luck had been on their side when the girls had examined the roster for the next day's flights. Had it been a smaller plane, they wouldn't have all fit. She took her seat and increased the revolutions to the engine. The plane gained speed and tore off down the runway, soaring over the hedge that marked the end of the aerodrome. In the back, one of the men was stirring. They were both tied to stretchers, requisitioned from the air ambulance storeroom. The girls had loaded the two unconscious pilots into the bomb bay of the Anson as the sun was beginning to rise, and it was an utter miracle that they'd not been seen. Emily had farewelled them with a kiss for luck just before dawn. Hamble was southwest of Maidenhead, but Mabel swung the plane out to the east until they could see the sparkling blue of the channel below them. He's waking up, Ruth yelled. What do I do? Leave him. There's not much he can do from there. Farrier's eyes opened and he made a quick mental assessment of the situation before screaming bloody murder. A bit pathetic, isn't he? Ruth said. Girls, I'm going to have to start heading back soon and and otherwise we run the risk of running into actual enemy planes out here, Mabel shouted. Florence and Ruth nodded to each other. Ruth pulled the lever to open the bomb bay door and suddenly the aircraft was filled with wind and the noise of the engines. Out you go, Ruth said unkindly and heaved the stretcher Humphreys was tied to. He didn't stir as he went over the edge. You know, I think he might have already been dead, she said lightly, as though she was commenting on the weather. And your next big boy, Florence said with a coy smile. N- no, w- w- what are you, you can't do this, my father, he'll... Farrier screamed, looking from one to the other in terror. Your father won't do a bloody thing. You'll just join the thousands of other brave pilots who died over the channel, Ruth said. Why are you doing this? I I can pay you. His desperate shouts fell on deaf ears. You killed our friend. You sabotaged Emily's plane. You planned to hurt others. Or maybe... We've just gone a bit loopy. The air up here, it's its very thin, you see, and our, our little female brains just can't cope, Florence replied, deadpan. Goodbye, flyboy, Ruth said as she heaved his stretcher out into the open air. His scream was gone in a second, taken by the November winds. Florence banged her fist against the cockpit. Mabel, let's go home. Mabel heard all that happened behind her cockpit and looked down to see if she could spot the falling stretchers. But they were gone, lost forever. She smiled as she pulled the photograph from her breast pocket. She pressed her lips to the photo, still flecked with Evelyn's blood, and turned the plane for home. The End Thanks so much for listening. We'd love to get your feedback and and we'd love to reach more listeners. Our website is sistersincrime.org.au and our email address is admin at sistersincrime.org.au. Until next Friday then, when we bring you another scintillating story from Australian women crime creators.